Now, there were a lot of headlines this week about net migration to, uh, to the UK falling last year by 20%. We've been talking about that. But really, that was only because the previous year's number was revised up by so much. Another 166,000 settled in the country then. In the year to June of uh, this year, it's thought that net migration was 728,000 people. Now, both main parties say they want to bring that number down significantly. Let's see. I'm joined now by the chair of the government's Migration Advisory Committee, Brian Bell. Uh, Professor Bell, were you surprised to hear that the ONS net migration figures had to be revised upwards thus so far? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you sort of hope revisions are pretty random and so they should be either up or down and you don't know. Um, so the revisions were up and were up quite significantly. That was a surprise. It's partly because the ONS produced the, result, the numbers quite fast after the uh, period that they're covering and then they learn more information as time goes on. So the revisions are legitimate. There's nothing wrong with making revisions, but it obviously made the story somewhat harder to understand this week. And it also makes conversation like this a bit tricky, doesn't it? Not, never mind government policy making. If you don't know what the numbers signify at the moment you receive them. Indeed. I mean, when people talk about a net migration target, are you targeting the number that the ONS first produces, or are you targeting the number they produce a few years later? Um, that's why, actually, we tend not to look too much at the month-to-month -month or the year-to-year -year numbers, and we think more about what the long-run trends are in net migration. It's a much more useful way of thinking about policy. Well, indeed, that's what I want to ask you about, because I, I remember a day when um, the, the sort of settled long-run number would be something like 200,000 net and so on. Now we're looking at something much higher than that. Where, where do you expect that longer-term sort of bed of inward migration to settle? I think without any further policy changes, it's likely that we'll settle at somewhere around 300 to perhaps 350,000 as the long-run figure. So higher than it was over the previous 20 years, but much, much lower, of course, than it is today. We, we do expect net migration to continue to fall, but towards a level of about 300,000. But 350,000 is a big number. It's a sizable town every year. It's 0.5% of the UK population every year. So, yeah. And it puts, uh, I suppose, the, the small boat number into context, does it not? Indeed. I mean, you know, the, the amount of uh, publicity, both in the media, but also, to be fair, among politicians over the last five years on small boats, is out of all proportion to their importance within net migration. And, you know, it's, it's about five, somewhere between 5 and 10% of the numbers are responsible for asylum, which includes the small boats. So we've spent far too much time focused on that, Relative, of course, very important issue, but relative to the legal migration side. If we look at, if you like, the, the big number, uh, 450,000 thereabouts on work, another 450,000 on study and so on, every government keeps saying we want to bring total immigration down because uh, the impact on services, etc. yet the numbers keep rising. Now, if you're going to do anything about it, you've got to do something about those big numbers, either the work route or the study route. Let's talk about the work route for a, a moment. In, in the past, you said that the, some of our sectors, particularly health and care, are too reliant on foreign workers. Is that still your view? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, we still don't train enough nurses and doctors in this country. And so unless we actually want wards not to have doctors and not have nurses, we do need to, we will need to bring them in from abroad. Um, it's the same in other sectors of the economy as well. That, that, that gap between um, what we need and what we're training for is, is big and has been for many. I mean, we haven't got a great record on skills training in this country for the last 20, 30 years, and this is the result that we see. Well, it takes years to train a doctor. Uh, even some, uh, a care assistant needs some t time of training. We are going to be uh, uh, stuck with, or we're going to have to have these numbers for a while. If we, you, we were to reduce the number of visas, what do you think would happen to our care sector or indeed the health sector? Well, probably not much, because what the government always tends to do, almost any political persuasion, is they always tend to exempt the public sector from any rules they make about visas. So I worry a lot that what they mean when they say things like, oh, we want to tighten rules on uh, work visas, they mean, oh, except for anything that we have to run ourselves. So the NHS has historically been protected. So when we had a cap, there was actually in the old days a cap on the number of visas we issued. It very rarely bound, but when it did, nurses and doctors were exempted from the cap. 
Um, and so probably that's what they would do again. But actually, if, if you took it logically, if we put a cap in or we put bore down on numbers, we'd have to turn around hospitals and say, no, you can't bring those nurses in this month. You can't bring those doctors in because we've reached the number. Um, and then we'd have to face the consequences of that. Well, I was talking to um, Victor Atkins, the um, shadow uh, environment secretary, about uh, uh, agricultural work, you know, cap on seasonal workers. Um, is it too strong to say... Uh, cap on seasonal workers equals fruit rotting in the fields. To an extent, of course, it's important to remember that seasonal workers, because they can only stay here for six months, actually don't feature in the figures at all. So you've got to stay more than a year in, the, in terms of how we measure net migration. So actually it doesn't matter how many seasonal worker visas we issue in terms of net migration statistics. But I think it is right that if you... Um, you know, we, we've just done a review of the seasonal worker scheme. If you made it more strict, then we're saying we, we're not going to grow stuff in this country. We'll import it from abroad. That's a choice that we make. I, I, I just want to ask very, very briefly a, a question about your work. But the problem is, perhaps, as we've been discussing, there's a slight dishonesty in the whole debate that actually we want all of these things. You can't have them without the people. That must make your job near to impossible. I mean, it does, in the sense that there's not a coherent... Often there's not a coherent policy across government. So perhaps to give you a really good example, we talked about students as an important set of numbers. The government has a policy... Or the previous government didn't, I have no reason to think this government isn't pursuing this policy, had a policy of having 600,000 international students in the UK. That was the Department of Education's objective. And no-one seemed to notice that if you wanted to have 600,000 international students in Britain, you would have to issue them visas. And there was no link... So we have a policy from the education department that says we must have 600,000 students in Britain. Well, you're going to have to issue them visas. Unless you change that policy, I don't see how you change the visa numbers. Then a challenge to government. Professor Bell, thank you so much for your time this morning.